happened in Paris uh, demonstrates their commitment to random violence in terms of going after the most vulnerable targets and carrying out as much mayhem and wreaking as much death and destruction as possible against the, the innocents. They have taken advantage of the freedoms and liberties that we are so proud of in, the, in much of the world. And they also have taken full advantage of social media, using that as an environment to indoctrinate, to communicate, brainwash, direct, guide, train. And also presenting a, I think, a very misleading narrative and impression of what is going on inside of Iraq and Syria. They have been able to use these great advances in technology to further their, their aims. Now certainly they have been aided by much instability and political upheaval and sectarian tensions throughout the region. And so they have been able to take advantage of that to be able to advance their goals and objectives. And as was noted, I started out in national security intelligence back in 1980. And I must say, I've never seen a time when we have faced more serious and consequential issues confronting our national security around the globe. Secretaries Kerry, Carter, myself, and others spend um, much time at the White House in the White House Situation Room with National Security Advisor Rice, President Obama, and others to address these issues that span the globe that are of such intensity as well as such consequence as well as uh, so quick to develop as well as to have impact around the world that there has been, again, never a time, I think, that the U.S. national security challenges have been greater, nor the requirement for the United States to be actively involved in trying to address these many challenges. <clears throat> I have spent a good part of my life working on, living in, studying in the Middle East. And I must say that the Middle East and the Islamic world is going through some very, very challenging times. <clears throat> Making the transition from authoritarian governments and regimes to try to move forward with democratic principles and reforms is certainly very challenging because of the embedded obstacles to those reforms, to include on the economic front, moving away from centrally planned statist economies to a free market capitalist system where individual <clears throat> um, opportunity is rewarded. But unfortunately, in many of these societies and countries, corruption remains rampant. <clears throat> there is still very weak institutions of governments, governance, internally displaced people, refugees, great uneven distribution of wealth. And so that when I look out over the next decade or more, and I see this great expanse of territory in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, I think we're still going to be facing serious challenges as we move forward. These challenges I mentioned, I think, are compounded by the new environment that we are dealing with, which is the digital domain, that cyber environment that can be used for great good and to advance the interests of prosperity and freedom and liberty, but also can be used as a domain and an environment for ill and to do harm. So whenever I, every month when I swear in a new glass class of CI officers, I tell them that this unsettled global landscape is going to demand their expertise, their dedication as we go forward working in strong partnership with our diplomatic law enforcement military partners here as well as, as abroad. And despite the unsettled nature of the global landscape, I believe that the U.S. is still looked at by the overwhelming majority of the world's populations as well as governments as something that is very, very special. Our commitment to universal values, to social, progress, to economic prosperity, to individual freedoms and liberties are much admired and widely, widely aspired to. And so I think as importantly is the strong reputation and capabilities and potential of the U.S. private sector because the U.S. private sector still is seen as the world's leader in innovation, 
entrepreneurship, education, medicine, technology, and science, and so much, much more. So I think this is the time for us to be able to stand tall among each other, stand tall with our allies and partners around the world as we face these challenges that are serious, that are unfortunately going to be enduring, at least for a while, so that we can, in fact, deal with the challenges that lie ahead in a collective and constructive way. Now, OSAC, I believe, plays a very, very important role in helping keep the U.S. dream alive here in the United States, but then worldwide. And so I am committed to making sure that CIA and the intelligence community does everything possible to work very closely with our State Department colleagues, as well as with the private sector, to ensure that we do our utmost to be able to optimize the safety and security of Americans and American companies and enterprises around the world. Earlier this week, I gave some remarks at, the, at CSIS here in Washington. And rather than repeating what was in there, I just would invite you to take a look. They're widely available on the website. I invite you to look at what I said as opposed to what has been unfortunately misrepresented <laughs> in some quarters by my good friends in the Fourth Estate. And so with that, I would welcome the opportunity to be able to uh, address uh, the questions that you might have uh, in the remainder of my time. We have uh, microphones on either side here, and so please, uh, for OSAC constituents and members, Please uh, walk forward, ask your question, and as Mr. Brennan said, he'll be happy to, to respond. Director Brennan, thank you very much for your presence here with us today. We hear quite often in, the, in terms of intelligence sharing internationally about the I-5 but we don't hear much about what's happening between us and France, of course, in the current days, and others in the Western world, developed economic uh, uh, societies that uh, are all the target of this threat that you've described for us here this morning. I'd like to hear, if I could, what, uh, what exchange is taking place on a broader intelligence community basis so we can fight them uh, more uh, comprehensively. Thank you. Thank you. When I look back over the last 14 years or so since 9-11, there has been tremendous progress here in the United States as well as internationally as far as putting together that architecture that is required to be able to share and access information in as rapid a fashion as possible. And as we have come to realize here in the States, a lot of the departments and agencies have different information technology systems, we have different authorities, we have different responsibilities as far as handling different types of information to include on U.S. persons, U.S. citizens. But I think we've come a very, very long way over the last 14 years. In addition, it's not just what we've been able to do here within the United States, and it's not just within the federal government. I think there is a lot of very good and robust sharing information with state and locals and others. We're trying to, and we have, in fact, made a lot of progress internationally. Those inf information sharing mechanisms you point out with the five eyes, with our so partners of Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, um, are, are rooted in uh, traditional sort of information sharing practices and systems. I would say that a lot of our information sharing practices and mechanisms with other countries, and you noted France, are as strong as what we have been able to do with our five eyes partners in terms of making sure that you have, again, the mechanisms to share the information. We share it electronically because we want to be able to make sure that it gets as, uh, to the recipient as quickly as we can. Uh, sometimes we still have to provide sort of hard copy of the information. But the real challenge is to make sure you take information that may be derived from very sensitive sources, whether it be human or technical, and wherever it might be acquired around the globe, it could have implications for somewhere else and to move the essence of that information, particularly if it's threat information, through a system that will enable the, uh, the person on the other end or the entity, the organization, to be able to receive it. So, for example, France, we have had uh, truly a very strong uh, interaction with our French partners. I'll be speaking again with my French partners today about what it is that we need to continue to do um, as far as 
sharing the information, but also sharing the strategic approaches and what our uh, policy uh, courses are so that we're able to deal with this challenge that we, we all face. But it does span the, the gamut of uh, partners around the globe. I mentioned at the session on Monday that over the last five weeks or so, I've had a number of conversations with my Russian counterpart. Uh, again, despite the policy difference we may have in Syria and Ukraine, uh, these have been discussions about how we can, in fact, share more information about this threat from ISIL and what we need to be able to do as far as having the analytic exchanges, but also the, uh, the, the procedures in place so that if we have uh, threat information, it's going to get to them uh, as quickly as possible. We take very seriously within the U.S. government our duty to warn responsibilities. And so if we have information about a threat to a particular uh, entity, person, or whatever, we make sure that we move it very, very quickly. I think, as you know, a lot of times threat information that comes in is broad, it's vague. Uh, sometimes the ultimate sourcing is uncertain. But at a time, particularly now, when there is concern that there could be other operations that are somehow underway, that threshold, in fact, is about as low as it can be. And so one of the challenges that we have as an intelligence community working with our partners is trying to separate out the wheat from the chaff this time. And particularly in the aftermath of these terrible uh, attacks, uh, there is always a spike in terms of people who will be reporting bogus threat information. And so it's really up to the professionals uh, within the government as well as in the private sector to be able to take uh, the information that's available and I do distinguish between the strategic warning in terms of it's almost the barometric pressure. You know that there's something that's brewing. You don't know exactly where it's going to hit or when, but there are things that you can do in light of what the intelligence portends. Uh, it's when you have the more specific intelligence, then you can take sort of preemptive action that's going to try to disrupt a plot that is, is underway. And uh, every day around the globe, uh, law enforcement, security, intelligence agencies are taking actions that disrupt the plans, intentions, and activities of these terrorist organizations. Unfortunately, uh, some get through, and I think this is what we have seen over the last several weeks. And I can tell you, as you I'm sure can tell me the same thing, these types of incidents only redouble the determination of intelligence and security professionals to make sure we do our jobs the best we can. And we certainly are going to do that. Surely I haven't answered all your questions. <laughs> there well, are maybe some. I can pose a question. Please. If, if, mm -hmm. uh, if our audience is a bit shy this morning. Uh, since Friday, since the attacks in, in uh, Paris, there's been a lot in the media regarding the threat that the refugees from Syria and other countries may or do pose. If you could comment a little bit on that, on how uh, you see the security situation uh, pertaining to the refugees that are coming to Europe and uh, to the United States. Well, that's certainly one of the biggest questions as well as the biggest challenges that uh, we are facing right now with the tremendous, tremendous um, displacement of individuals from these warring lands, whether it be Iraq or, or Syria and uh, Syria, a country of 24 million or so before the conflict, uh, is approaching 50% of the population that has been either internally displaced or that has moved across the borders to neighboring countries or migrating then to uh, Europe and, and beyond. And I do think it is important uh, for us to do a number of things. One is we are a country, certainly I believe we are a country, that prides itself on its tradition of welcoming people from around the globe. There is no other country on the, on the face of the earth that is more of a melting plot, pot than the United States. And so what we want to do is to make sure that we are able to maintain uh, our commitment to those, those values and the thing that, things that have made this country great, which is why we don't want the terrorists to succeed in terms of what it is that they're trying to do. At the same time, I think it makes it even more incumbent on the security and intelligence professionals to make sure that we are able to uh, look at individuals who are coming into this country with an eye toward what it is that we might know about individuals or ways that terrorist organizations might try to secret people into these networks and into these refugee flows. 
And so one of the things that I certainly am determined to do and working in concert with my fellow uh, partners, both here as well as abroad, is to see what we can do to strengthen that system that allows us to have as best insight as possible into the backgrounds of these individuals as well as what their intentions might be. Uh, and so what we need to do is to strike that balance. And as I <clears throat> noted uh, earlier this week, there are a number of challenges from a legal, policy, uh, political standpoint that makes striking this balance um, uh, challenging. Uh, we need to make sure we're able to uh, have the government play what I think is certainly its rightful role in protecting its citizenry. And for many years, decades, centuries, we have had experience about what it means to be uh, vigilant in the physical domain. On terra firma, in the uh, maritime domain, in the aviation and air domain. This new domain of digital domain is something that is very new as far as our, our history, our experience. And what we need to be able to do is to make sure that we understand what that appropriate role is for the government in that digital domain. Because if the government's primary responsibility is to care for the security and welfare of its people, it needs to do that in all of the domains. And so there is a great debate about what the government's role is in that domain. And there should be that great debate about what it is that we need to do in order to balance individual rights and civil liberties and what is the appropriate role for government in that domain in order to protect its citizenry. Uh, I don't think we're there yet as far as being able to understand all of the dimensions of that domain. It's one of the reasons why at CIA we have recently created a new directorate of digital innovation because that domain fundamentally affects my agency's ability to be able to operate and carry out its intelligence mission since many of the things we do need to be done clandestinely. And all of you here, all of us, have a forensic history in that digital domain. When we use our ATM cards, when we pump gas, when we check into a hotel or get on an airplane, we create that forensic history that is recoverable and knowable, not just by nation states that are out there that might be our adversaries from a counterintelligence standpoint, but also from groups that have the capability to understand, manipulate, exploit that digital domain. And so if we try to avoid the question of what the government's role is in that domain and say the government should not play a role in it, I think we do it at our peril. And I think this is one of the fundamental challenges that this country is going to face in the coming years. And I'm certainly determined to do what I can to be able to explain, from my perspective at least, what I see as those challenges, those threats, those risks, as well as those opportunities. And as we have done, I think, through the course of our history, we need to be able to strike that proper balance between the great individual freedoms and privacy rights that we embrace and we love and we want to keep near and dear, but also making sure that our families, our children, our neighbors, our communities, indeed our international community, is kept safe from what those who would cause us harm, would want to cause us harm, can do in terms of its ability to operate within that digital domain. Because that digital domain is the World Wide Web is owned and operated by 85% by the private sector. And that's why the partnership that OSAC over the last 30 years has really epitomized needs to extend beyond the physical domain. It needs to extend into that digital domain. And it needs to extend beyond our sovereign borders because the digital world, the digital domain, does not respect those sovereign borders. You can move things around the world at the speed of light and hop around so many countries. And unless there's going to be some type of international understanding about what is appropriate and acceptable within that digital domain, we're going to face a world of hurt in the future. And so my emphasis, because of what it is that I have been able to understand what our adversaries, those who want to cause us harm, those who want to kill and maim 
in the streets of Paris as well as around the world, how they can operate within that environment. And we need to make sure that we're comfortable with what it is that we are expecting our government to do and what the government is, quite frankly, obliged to do in order to make sure that our way of life is maintained in the future. Yes. Um, That's a microphone. Yes, please. Uh, David Smith of The Guardian. Um, what um, impact do you think Edward Snowden's revelations had on everything you've just talked about in that debate over privacy? And, and secondly, could you just give us your current assessment of the threat level to the, to the US homeland in the wake of the, the Paris attacks? I think any unauthorized disclosures that are made by individuals who have dishonored the oath of office that they raised their hand and attested to um, undermines this country's security. And so individuals who have done that over time. <laughs> and heroizing such individuals I find to be <clears throat> unfathomable as far as what it is that this country needs to be able to do, again, in order to keep itself safe. And a lot of people who are speaking out there about what in some individuals have done and uh, applauding it have no understanding, are totally ignorant of what it is that such people have wrought. And so what we need to be able to do in the future is to make sure that, again, this balance between individual rights and liberties and the government's sacred obligation to keep its people safe and secure needs to be struck. But it needs to evolve because just the way the world has changed over the last 50 years, fundamentally, it has transformed. There's been a revolution in technology. We need to be able to adapt to this new reality. Anybody else? One over here. Thanks, Les. Might go over there to the. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Scott Bronner with Concilium, sir. Thank you for your comments most recently here and for your time today. Uh, there's a lot of young people here in this, in this group uh, who are entering into time of government service and also in security with these companies. And so uh, my question is this. Uh, given your experience uh, in, in the government and what you've done for years, do you have hope for the future? And if so, what gives you that hope? <laughs> That's a fair question <laughs> in terms of what I just talked about. Absolutely. I am hopeful, not only hopeful, I am optimistic. Because as we've looked back over our history as a country, we have had to deal with some tremendous, tremendous challenges. The threat and specter of nuclear war. Nazi Germany in terms of just rolling over Europe. In each one of these instances, I think the clouds looked rather dark and the future looked bleak. But because of what it is that, again, this country is founded upon, I think we have always risen to the occasion. Now, what I really want to have happen when I talk about the digital world and the cyber world, I don't want to have to see or the United States to endure so the equivalent of a 9-11. We need to be able to take these actions preemptively, preventively, prophylactically, as opposed to doing it in the aftermath of a crisis. And so when I think about the Internet of Things and how we're going to be even more dependent on this World Wide Web, we really need to be mindful of what, not just what those opportunities are, but then what the vulnerabilities are and the dependencies on security. When I talk to our, our new uh, recruits as well as student groups that I go out and I, I encourage them to pursue their dreams of being involved in national security, international affairs or intelligence <clears throat> because I tell them there this is such a historic time for so many reasons. The global landscape that's changing, the challenges we face, technology that is changing on a daily basis, they're coming in at a time of great opportunity if you're a national security intelligence specialist. But for students, I also give them a word of caution and warning. I say that once you get in to the realm of security and intelligence, national security, it gets into your blood. 
it is something that drives you. You become addicted to making sure that you're doing your level best and your the absolute best in order to achieve what it is that your mission asks of you, which is to keep this country strong and safe. And so for the past 35 years, with a brief interregnum in the private sector, which was really designed, you know, focusing on security, it has certainly something that has motivated me to work with professionals, not just at CIA, but around, across the U.S. government and, and around the, the globe, as well as people from the private sector, who are really determined to make sure that this country is able to attain even greater heights in the future. So I encourage people, and young officers who are here who are part of this effort, we now have a new type of challenge that we have to face. This is the time, as I said, that we need to be able to stand tall and to let those who want to do us harm know that we are the United States of America, that we can stand up to this and we're going to get through it. And we're going to do it in partnership with our good friends and allies around the globe. Uh, and I certainly uh, am willing to continue to do what I can uh, in partnership with you. So thank you so much. I believe I have to go. Uh, I wish you well. I thank you for your...